All right. And let's see all the participants dribble in. There we go. It's amazing how fast they come in once you once you open the floodgates. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello. Chat. Give them give them another minute to come in. Yeah. Probably don't need the full minute. We're already past 30. It's just kind of fun to watch. <laughs> oh, here's every, everybody's talking. Okay, great. I was definitely concerned that no one would come. And not just <laughs> That's our concern. That's always a concern like a month or two out. Hoping. No one's going to come. <laughs> but yeah, we, we're good. We got enough people. It was great. <laughs> yes, it is metal. And it's... It's just a hood, so it's it's not that heavy. Also, it's not like really good. It was like twenty bucks on on Amazon. They they the rings aren't uh, uh, riveted. They're just bent wire. <laughs> okay, let's get going. Um, I think we got everybody here. So you guys have all heard this speech uh, enough times, but. Um, I'm helping with tech support and moderating the chat. I'm Benjamin Jacobs. I'm the admin. Um, I don't work for Zoom, so I'm not a complete expert. But if you have any problems, say something in the chat, and maybe I'll be able to help you out. Um, the session, when the session starts shortly, there will be 20 minutes of presentation, roughly, roughly, followed by 20 minutes of Q&A. Whatever happens, we will be ending 40 minutes sharp. If you have a question for the Q&A, you have two options. You can ask using voice chat by hitting the raise hand button at the bottom, and then I will uh, allow you to speak uh, when it's your turn. Or you can just write it in the text chat and I'll read it out for you. Excuse me. Um, keep the questions relatively family friendly. Any abusive behavior will result in removal from the session and a repeat performance, though at this point that's impossible, will result in getting booted from the event without a refund. Um, with that, let me introduce our speakers for whom I have specially dressed up because I just binged through the last 10 episodes. I finally got to the, the Hastings episode and uh, it was it was spectacular. It was so good. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, okay, obviously I'm a fan. Um, <laughs> the British History Podcast is one of the, the OG old guard of history podcasting. And it is excellent, well-researched, well-written, um, well-produced. And um, these two are responsible for that, um, for good or bad, I suppose. <laughs> um, and as such, they are uniquely well suited to talk about today's topic, which is the state of the podcast industry. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn off my camera and let you guys take over. Well, hello, I'm uh, I'm Jamie. I'm this Z. Is, hey. Yeah. And we're behind the British History Podcast. Um, I believe Ben in the um, the literature actually said called us grandparents. So thanks for that. Yeah, the grandparents of podcasting. Loved it. <laughs> but we have been here a while, and I apologize for people who are thinking that they were going to come see us and get something a little more history focused. Um, we're actually going to be talking a little bit about the future, and we're going to be talking about something that a lot of people, especially creators, uh, e creators and history people in particular, we don't like to talk about, but we're going to have to. So. Put on your uh, thinking caps. We're talking. It's like history, but for the future is what we're going to be talking we're about We're going to talk about business. Uh, right. Because unfortunately, for better or for worse, uh, podcasting has kind of turned into an industry. Um, and uh, and Ben's right. We've got to talk about the absolute state of it. Um, so I'm going to do a screen share if I can figure this out. Uh, yep. Share. Okay, uh, slideshow. Okay, uh, let's see. Can you all see that? Is is this? Can somebody say in the uh, the chat whether or not they can see this? Yeah, <laughs> good. Okay, cool. Okay, so welcome to this. Uh, so, what we want to start with the basic concept is what makes podcasting special. And how do we protect it? Because we've been doing this now for about 11 years. And in that 11 years, a lot has changed. 
Um, it's it started out very punk rock, and now it is uh, a lot more uh, professional. And these things have good and bad elements to it. So, what made what made in the early days podcasting special? Podcasting it's great because podcasts are fairly easy to make. They're fairly cheap to make, and they can be shared almost infinitely to almost everyone anywhere. All you need is a device or somewhere to access the podcast and you can get this information. So as a consequence, the early days of podcasting kind of felt like this, right? It felt like it was democratized media. And so it felt very much like you're on the forefront of something that, that is changing things. Uh, and also you're, you're breaking down barriers of old um, kind of fiefdoms. And what was cool about it was it was open to anyone. Anyone with a mic and, and a desire, for the most part, could start one. As a consequence, it was pretty un unprofessional and informal, and that led to a lot of standard tropes of podcasting, like the, the standard opening of, hey, guys, you know, things like that. And that actually made it feel a lot more accessible. It was a lot more accessible. It tended to be a lot more, it, it tended to be pretty hobby-based. Uh, pretty much everybody who started this uh, uh, did it as a hobby. And delightfully, it was largely ad and marketing free. Now, as it felt like that, it looked more like this. And the, the, the cold hard reality of early podcasting was it had a high potential for diversity, but a low actualization of diversity. It was a lot of dudes with beards. I think I qualified as one of the more uh, uh, diverse podcasts because I didn't have a beard. <laughs> and that's about how it went for those early days. Uh, and in those early days, it was also universally seen as absolutely dorky. Uh, it was so dorky that when people asked what I did uh, in those early days, I used to kind of stutter and shuffle my feet and would mutter, oh, I'm involved in broadcasting, because uh, I just did not want to admit <laughs> that I was making podcasts. But that's kind of what podcasting is. What makes it special? The thing that makes it special is there's almost nothing between the creator and the audience. It's awesome in that regard. Usually you have a lot of barriers in between that, but for us, for podcasters, uh, for podcasters and for podcast listeners, for the audience, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, you, you can have a direct contact. And so it takes media from this and turns it into a conversation, right? It turns it into this. And then something changed. And Ben Kenobi here on Kenobi Cast figured it out right away. And I'm guessing if you are up on podcast history and you're looking at the date, you can guess what changed. It was this. Serial happened. Serial changed everything. All of a sudden, we got cool. We got cool for the first time in our lives. My parents suddenly figured out what podcasts were and took an interest in what I was actually doing for like the first time. <laughs> uh, so what does cool mean? 62% of Americans 12 and over listen to podcasts. 104 million Americans listen to podcasts regularly. Now for scale, 76.1 million Americans are subscribed to cable TV in 2011, uh, 2021. So that means that we're bigger than cable. And also, I didn't put the numbers here, we're, uh, more Americans listen to podcasts than have Netflix. This is your, like, John Lennon, we're bigger than Jesus uh, <laughs> moment. <laughs> um, and so this actually led to a gold rush, right? All of a sudden, businesses figured out what was going on here and how this was a growing er area. And suddenly, everybody got very interested in this. And... Uh, I mean, I'm sure that you're familiar with Spotify. Uh, Daniel Eck in particular took uh, quite a lot of interest uh, in what was going on here. I feel like I've been talking a lot. Yes. So uh, once serial happened and once the majority of Americans tuned in um, spectacularly, and we had that moment of legitimization from formal media, which is a big part of why Spotify, uh, not Spotify, um, uh, serial uh, was such a big deal was 
uh, tech no companies took notice. And so now tech companies are trying to monetize podcasts. What used to be cheap to make, cheap to produce, and cheap to get out there to anyone, um, they're trying to find ways to make money at every step, um, which is we know is unnecessary because we didn't need it before. Um, and now it's really going to break podcasting if we're not careful. Um, so three ways tech companies, we're going to run you through how it works, uh, are trying to get in between podcasts and audiences. One is walled gardens, advertising is second, and three technology services. The first is the walled garden that we're going to sort of run you through of how this works, where it's coming from, what it looks like. Um, this started through the algorithm sort of hedge garden, a soft walled garden. Um, Apple sort of invented the podcast as we know it, how it was packaged, how it was put out there in a way that was easily accessible. Um, and the way that they made podcasts visible in the early days was through this soft algorithmic process where it was, there was an algorithm about listeners and tuning in. And there's also literally a guy who got to decide stuff he liked and he would put it up on those, you know, those, um, what did they call them? They call them spotlights. Yeah, uh, or, yeah, yeah I think it was spotlight highlights. Yeah. Um, it was just a guy who was hired by Apple who was in charge of this and it was stuff he liked. People thought there was more to it than that. It was just that. Um, but that meant that Apple got to pick the original winners or losers. That now means that there's no easy way for a podcast to get out to uh, tons of numbers of uh, potential audiences very easily. And to be clear, that was as good as it was, like that's as good as it's gotten for us. It's actually, it's gotten worse from that point forward because the, 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 the landscape has fractured. And so we have a lot of people who are, are picking and choosing those winners and losers. And we also have wall gardens. Yeah, so now podcasts go looking for an attempt to get out of the bottom of that algorithm problem. And so they've got companies who are saying, we'll do that for you. If you're exclusive to us, we'll put you out and we'll promote you ourselves within our walled garden context. That's Luminary, uh, that's Wondery, uh, that's Spotify. Uh, Spotify is doing this on a tiered level uh, through time and now space internally. Um, and the thing is, walled gardens claim to provide audiences to podcasts as a service, but what they're actually doing is the opposite. Wall gardens are about putting multiple barriers between content creators and audiences and then monetizing it. So they're trying to say they do one thing, but they're very explicitly doing the other. Um, and in general, what we need to understand is that tech companies today are rapidly moving towards a complete ownership of digital ecosystems. They want the whole pie. Um, and so when a show joins that ecosystem, it becomes their product. It's no longer yours and they can charge for it. Right. So when you join these, when a show, or if, if anybody who's listening uh, is running a show, if, if you decide to uh, join one of these walled gardens, one of these ecosystems and have an exclusive uh, um, deal with that, um, you you functionally are, are setting yourself apart from everybody else and uh, and you you become that ecosystem's thing. Um, so consequently, my take on this whole thing is very much like Daniel like took a look at uh, at the notebook and was like, man, these two look like they're really into each other. What if we have uh, Gosling sign an exclusive contract and we charge McAdams to access him? So, The first, the first thing, the first way that these uh, these wall gardens work is they monetize the uh, the audience. Uh, I believe is where, yeah. So the true, or not this, the, the the primary way. So the true product of these platforms that they're actually purchasing when they're doing these exclusive deals is actually you, the audience. Oh, that's. <laughs> So we, we just we like that was it was we made a funny thing sorry i apologize that was not normally our level of production level <laughs> um so yeah saying basically the other thing that we're doing is part of how they're selling is they're they're for those of you who are listeners here um you're going to be the actual product um so what they're selling is listener access advertising opportunities metadata um, but in order to do that, they need your, the podcaster's product and the podcaster no longer has control over it. Um, so how does that impact the podcaster audience relationship? I believe we need to speed up here. Um, so what makes podcasting special is that 
relationship with the audience and the podcast is that gets broken. Um, and so the podcaster has to think about more than just what the audience would enjoy. Now you're trying to make Luminary happy. Now you're trying to make Spotify happy. And we've seen some major political spills over the last year, especially around Spotify, as they make political decisions, shows try to push back. And originally podcast has been pretty free of that kind of nonsense. Um, but as if you put yourself in these walled gardens, suddenly it becomes your issue, becomes our issue as, as a, a collective. Um, and then exclusive platforms ultimately get to decide what the audience can see, how much the audience has to pay, and what kind of user experience the audience has. So if their app goes to crap because they decided to stop paying their coders, uh, that's now your audience's problem and your problem. And you won't be able to fix it. You can't just say, go to another podcast app. Um, and ultimately, the thing that concerns us most is there are shows that don't tend to be invited into walled gardens. New and non-celebrity shows, small independent shows, niche shows, uh, innovative and challenging shows. If you're saying something that Spotify doesn't like, you're not going to get invited. Um, if you start saying something Spotify doesn't like, they're happy to kick you out. Uh, yes, yes, definitely cough, cough, Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and eventually we come, become something like Netflix, right? Uh, it, we are now in the problem that TV is in or movies is in um, and everything that made podcasting awesome and that it just about anybody could talk to anybody else is going to break down um, and it will be hard to get that back. Uh, the second one is advertising. Remember, podcasting has as many listeners tuned in as cable has viewers. So we're huge as a collective. Um, and podcast audiences are highly cultivated, passionate, and have high levels of trust for the podcast host. So um, as someone who has done a lot of research in media, like there is nothing that advertisers want more than something like a podcast audience. We're as good as audiences get in terms of being able to get the sort of product they want in a way they're going to listen to it. You can go. <laughs> Switch off. Um, so uh, oh, we already said that. Okay. So uh, why are podcasts so popular among podcasters? Or sorry, why are ads so popular among podcasters? They cost the listener nothing. Uh, they cost the podcaster nothing but time. And culturally, it's accepted in the world of podcasting. We just accept that if we're going to listen to a podcast, we're going to hear about Blue Apron. That's that's just part for the course. So why are we saying that this is actually a bad thing? Because this means that businesses are seeking to monetize you, the audience. And that can actually have a terrible impact on what shows actually end up getting made. See, the hidden effect of advertising is that advertising... They, it, they pay out based on audience size, pretty much exclusively. And so this pushes shows to create content that has the broadest possible appeal because they want the largest audience if they want that advertising payout. So new concepts, new voices, and new topics suddenly become risky. And instead, the incentive becomes to duplicate a successful show. You want to do something that feels a bit more like I don't know, Joe Rogan, because then you will probably get those advertising dollars. So who benefits from this model? Because there are people who benefit from this model. Pre-existing pre shows, preferably ones with large audiences, shows that have broad appeal, celebrity hosts is a big deal, and shows that have corporate support. As for those who are harmed by this model, new shows, niche shows, independent shows, new voices, and new and untested concepts. So for example, Welcome to Night Vale was pretty much a new and untested concept. Uh, that would be super risky for an advertiser uh, until it actually gets its feet under it. And I'm not sure if something like Welcome to Night Vale could have launched in 2022 if there weren't other shows already that were like it, because uh, Night Vale kind of just forged it forward for everybody. But on top of all that, it also is just bad for the listener experience. Ads suck. What do meal kits, cheap glasses, and audiobooks have to do with true crime? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Why are we hearing about it? 
So on the whole, advertising and, and its push isn't just pernicious. It also just kind of ruins the vibe of, of podcasting. I, I like, on, we don't like it on a feel level, but it also is going to end up breaking that uh, the direct contact that we have between podcasts and their audiences. I go back. It gets in between. Well, okay. Uh, so... Um, we're now going to talk about services and I pressed the wrong button, but here we are. Um, so podcasters have become a market in themselves, right? Uh, uh, most podcasters listening to this, uh, if, you've, if you've done a lot of searching about how to start a podcast, you probably experienced this. You're going to have an inbox that's full of marketing emails for various services. And they're advertised as specifically for podcasters. So SEO, graphics, publishing aids, shady Facebook promotions, transcripts, editing, audio cleanup work, app development, payment services, hosting options. The list is really endless. And some of these services do have the potential to make launching a show easier. Launching a show back in 2011 was actually fairly DIY and pretty hard. But many of these services are also predatory and they seek to monetize naive content creators. Thank you, Ben. So uh, I'll really quickly sum up my story with Libsyn. Uh, Libsyn reached out to me at one point. Uh, uh, this is years ago, about six years ago. Um, yeah, uh, to move my my show over to them. And uh, I ended up talking to the VP. Um, we were going back and forth on email and it sounded like it was actually a good option. And then- Because uh, we were having a hard time hosting our content uh, properly and getting ways for our members to donate to the show to keep it going. Yeah, so they were providing a kind of all-in-one service and it sounded really great. Uh, but- the uh, they were getting really cagey on on what it would cost, and it wasn't until I got the guy on the phone and talked to him directly that I found out how much he wanted to charge, and it was fifty percent. He wanted fifty percent of every single dollar, <laughs> which is just all going forward, no matter how big the show got. Um, and again, this there was this was to take over something that currently was costing us about fifty bucks a month. <laughs> yeah, just bonkers. <laughs> So, uh, so for new podcasters or for podcasters who uh, are starting to move into areas to, uh, to grow further, red flags to watch out for, uh, if, they, if they, the company themselves are retaining and keeping uh, secret the audience contact information, if, if how the audience can contact you and how you can reach out to them is their exclusive domain, that's a red flag. Uh, like retaining the right to hike prices. You might remember what happened with Patreon. Uh, that should definitely be avoided. Uh, if they're charging a percentage of your revenue rather than a flat fee, that suggests also, because they can give you the impression that actually it's going to be cheap, but it also, what they're banking on is that you're going to grow. And from that point on, uh, because they're controlling all these other things, they're just going to start picking your pocket. Um, and then uh, if they insist that you use their partner companies under their terms that they've already negotiated, that's also bad. This was part of what Libsyn was doing was Libsyn was saying, we'll take 50%. And also you can then get on Spotify because they're going to Wall Garden stop Spotify for two years. Yeah, I don't even, I don't know if many people were, were on this at this, this point. Early, early on when Spotify said we had podcasts, it was exclusively for really big shows and shows that were on Libsyn. Mm -hmm. So, and they had an enormous audience. So that was how they were leveraging this whole corporate partnership. So they were going to use big shows like Mark Marin, uh, like Joe Rogan. They, I'm sure they got much better deals, those big shows. And then they were going to bring on a suite of cultivated shows, offer this very horrible deal, honestly, basically you get all half <laughs> your business forever. So you can get on Spotify for two years because it's a walled garden and you'll get more audience. Right. So, uh, so obviously we didn't do that. Um, so, uh, but let's let's yeah we got to move. I'm going to go through this. This kind of just goes every okay. thing we've already been talking about. Sorry. If we're going to protect what makes podcasting special, we need to protect the close relationship between the podcaster and the audience. I think that's the most important thing. Is we need to be laser focused like on that yeah. as audience members because we are huge fans of podcasts too, and as podcast makers, um, we also need to help new voices enter the space and protect them from predatory interests. Which is why we're bringing this very boring talk to you is because we think it's really important, especially to be having right now. Um, and listeners need to seek out new shows rather than simply accepting what the algorithm is selecting for them. Um, that it takes a little legwork if you're an audience member too. Um, and that also means if someone's got a way to support them, that's maybe a little different or takes a little more time, 
uh, try to do that. And let's normalize that process. Um, Oh, and uh, that, that other one was uh, uh, that we just accidentally skipped past. Uh, podcasters, I, I feel like we need to help new shows uh, get off the ground. We uh, we as established podcasters need to kind of take a, uh, a mentor uh, position and also just do what we can to, to help promote smaller shows and newer shows uh, because larger corporate shows are not going to do that. And so the way that we protect the independent character and the thing that makes podcasting special is that we have to do the legwork ourselves and we have to protect this space. Mm -hmm. So our advice for new and prospective podcasters who are listening to this, always retain control over your content, your audience information, your price rates. Demand a fair and fat, uh, flat price for any service that, uh, I say fat? Yep. Okay, <laughs> flat price for any service you use. Be very skeptical of any uh, 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 advertising deals uh, because chasing advertising dollars uh, can have some knock-on effects that you might not be thinking about right, right away. And refuse and resist uh, uh, being in walled gardens and, and accepting walled gardens. Walled gardens, that way lies death, for sure. Um, we so, don't have to go back to this. We can stay a little bit more like this, but just not with so many white guys. So more like this. That's it. So that's that's our talk. Wait, let's leave this open. We can okay. go to questions. We're <laughs> have a good look. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so Ben, do you have any questions for us to answer? Yes, I do. We've got several. Um, we sorry, we're this? very late. We're wordy. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, you're you're actually you're fine. Um, uh, just very quickly, Jack, the hood is not comfortable, but it can, <laughs> you can get a cotton thing. It's fine. Does uh, it pull your hair? It looks like um, it your hair. My my hair is pretty. It's fine. I, I mean, a little bit but it can. Um, Sydney, is Patreon secretly shady or are they on the level? I, I don't know if they're secretly shady. Um, I, I they're openly shady. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was highly suspect that they just went and changed uh, their rates and uh, basically passed the buck on everybody else. They reversed it, but there were a ton of, um, a ton of podcasts, a ton of uh, creators of all kinds, not just podcasters, that lost a lot of supporters because Patreon flipped a switch and just decided that they were going to change the way fees happen. And everybody thought it was the person they were paying who did it. So they decided to vote with their wallets. Yeah. A lot of people just lost their jobs that day, just straight up their entire business that they've been building collapsed that day because of, but, but they charge too much for what they're doing. Um, they encourage practices that are frankly bad for businesses. Those, those, um, the prize levels where they yeah. do extra thing is creating a runaway effect where people are having to focus that instead of, on that instead of the thing that they're trying to do well. It's Patreon's openly shady. Yeah, I um, I we're not on Patreon. We've had people ask us to be on Patreon, and and uh, our perspective is it, the more you can do in house, the better. Um, if you're if you're making a show or or doing a creative uh, uh, endeavor of any kind, um. But uh, on top of that, the, yeah, the, um, I think it's called rewards level. It creates obligation creep. You're constantly trying to one up the next uh, thing. And eventually what you're making uh, and what you're doing isn't the show that people want. You're just making little, you know, chintzy things. And it trains people to kind of want that, which is off. And, and they're also the ones, some of the ones, the biggest um, offenders in terms of keeping all that data so that if something happens and you want to contact everyone like, Hey, I've got to move platforms or hey, you have no way to do that. And they're doing that on purpose so that you can't yeah. leave. I don't know if they still do that or not, but they definitely were early on. Uh, uh, so that was another reason why we were like, absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, for my personal experience, before I move on to other questions, you know, I, I use a service, I use Patreon but from day one, it's been like, I'm not doing rewards. I mean, like I do <laughs> rewards, but like my reward is I make up a funny name for people and people seem I, to love it. I would love a Patreon that did that kind of, cause it is hard yeah. work to, that did it fairly in a way that, yeah. that was uh, as a genuine partner and at a fair price. That's, that's all I want. Yeah. Elspeth asks, uh, this is a more, uh, so let's start with a statement. <laughs> this is a more technical aspect than the topic of your talk, but I'm curious. 
I'm an archivist and professionally we talk a lot about the concept of digital dark ages, that the born digital material of the current era will largely vanish for future research due to the challenges of upgrading files to each new platform and the way data can be effectively locked simply by the passage of time and the evolution of technology. What are your thoughts on this regarding podcasting? It freaks me out actually. I actually uh, have really specific answers for this because okay. I actually did internet research. So I'm, I uh, did a bunch of work on political rhetoric and so, and how that transformed in the public in, uh, over time. And uh, I was at a top research university, London School of Economics, and I literally could, could have deals where I was trying to talk to the, the top people at Twitter to get me that data. Um, and it doesn't exist. They don't have it. It's gone. Uh, so yeah. some of the most important political rhetoric that we would want is, is like sociologists, sort of a current historian and then historians going forward. That's gone. Uh, it's a it's a, it's a huge, huge problem. interesting problem. Yeah. 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 Uh, like uh, we keep everything that we make on the cloud. Uh, which is terrifying because a single solar flare could just wipe everything out. We also out, make hard copies. Which is why, time. yes, we burn things on on uh, on on disk, uh, specifically burning, so that way, like, there's it's it's safer. But at the same time, like the We're problem, digital preppers, folks, you've heard it here. <laughs> but, the, but the problem there is, yeah, with with technology changing, if you've got something that's on one of those old zip disks, but you can't find a zip disk uh, drive, well, that's that's just a coaster. Yeah, yeah, I. Uh... I cleared out my desk one time, the previous sitter at my desk for my day job had been there at that desk for 25 years. And there was all sorts of exciting, obsolete technology stuffed in drawers. <laughs> when I was moving, uh, I found a tape that was on Betamax, which I was really excited about, so. <laughs> Wesley asks, I've uh, been doing this since 2014 and I often get asked by newer podcasters how to grow their listeners. I don't have a great answer because of how different the landscape was in 2014. What would you tell people if they asked you this question? Oh God, launch in 2011. Um, Honestly, I, this might be where the the we someone mentioned podcast union and yes, podcast union um, yeah, is yeah. where maybe we need to start some new practices about promoting each other's shows, uh, yeah. uh, like so that audiences can jump to without have, relying on temp co tech companies to mediate that mediate that or overcharge for that um that might be our real solution yeah uh, my, my experience is that you know i wasn't one of the first or second rounds of podcasters and i got my i've gotten my listeners just through the community and just talking to people on social yeah. media yeah. yeah um okay let me see am i Okay, let me finish up the Q&A stuff and then I'll go back to the chat. Uh, Roberto asks, what would you recommend niche shows about underrepresented or uh, areas or topics do to grow as a podcast? Okay, that's kind of the same question. Same thing. Yeah, and, and yeah, I think there's there's also yeah being active on social media can help it really depends on the social media uh, uh, and where um, like there are certain subreddits that are actually really great yeah, and most subreddits media. are horrible. Uh, so but I do think we start, we need to start really thinking about some new practices and do that yeah. collectively and stop thinking as a competition. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Welcome to Anarchist Talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> let me just, okay, Bill, um, Bill Henry, why do you podcast for you personally? Uh, God, I, honestly, I don't think I couldn't not podcast. I, I, I could not podcast. I, um, it means he's unhirable. I am unhirable. <laughs> uh, uh, if I don't even know if, uh, if I'm suited for this job, um, I, I absolutely love, uh, the the experience of of connecting with just people all over the world uh i it was very exciting when i launched the show in in 2011 i genuinely thought that nobody but my parents would listen to it um and my parents never have listened to it uh but uh but a lot of other people did and ultimately what was going on there was i wanted to make friends who were interested in the same kind of stuff i was uh because none of my friends cared uh my best friend was about to throttle me if he had to hear one more story about the dark ages. And so I, uh, I was just desperate for an outlet. And that was why I started. And it's, 
is easily one of the best decisions I've ever made. I, it's, uh, it's well worth, I, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, uh, making podcasts, it's an absolute blast. Um, okay. Uh, Jenny asks, what are some suggestions for building revenue that are non shady? Uh, so we tend to, we not tend to, we exclusively, uh, have a membership system. Um, so, uh, and I, I will say this, I shamelessly ripped it off from NPR. Uh, my, my, my whole strategy right from the start was I will give it all away for free. And, uh, and if you like it, I will have little extras, uh, that I will provide, uh, as a way of saying, thank you for helping me keep it going. So the podcast equivalent of that tote bag that you get from NPR, uh, and the, the whole idea behind it when I started, uh, was, uh, a friend of mine mentioned this to me, um, it was the idea of uh, a thousand true fans. So if you've got, if you've got something that you're a true fan of that you absolutely adore, uh, for me, other than, uh, uh, than history, it's uh, Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of Star Wars here. Um, in, an, in an average year, you, if you're just a huge fan of something, you'll probably spend at least 60 bucks on that thing. Um, and so the idea behind that was if you can find a thousand true fans worldwide of, of the thing that you really want to make, uh, then you can start actually, you know, making a, a, uh, a modest wage. You can make a decent wage doing that thing. And so uh, that was that was the the impetus for why we decided to build the the uh, uh, the show the way we did, uh, and then to make sure that we could afford to use that money to to live and keep the show going, we also went and uh, uh, ensured that I, I I was doing almost everything in house. I had to learn how to do it, HTML and everything, um, which I highly recommend. I, I my personal view is if there's if if you're trying to make a show and you're trying to uh, 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 have revenue from it, you want to make sure that you can do, a, you can wear as many hats in it as you, as possible. Cause if there's something that you can't do, then you're kind of at that person's mercy. Uh, it's also a good idea to select good payment processors and, uh, and have a diverse, uh, uh, option of, of payment processors. We use Stripe and PayPal. Uh, long-term time listeners will remember that for a while I was on Amazon and then at one point Amazon just randomly decided to stop and just cancel everything and uh, that was like half of all of our supporters just vanished yeah. overnight yeah. so like diversify would be the other mm -hmm. thing I would say. Basically you don't have to make that much money if you can keep it <laughs> yeah. so if you're doing everything yourself then you're keeping that money and, and you can stay a small show so long as there's you know a thousand people at 60 bucks was the number for you know 2011 it's inflation's probably <laughs> but do the math what do you yeah. need and then yeah try and aim for that yeah um james says um i'm not sure that i agree with you on advertising the money that it brings really helps me pay the bills and justify the time that i devote to the podcast where i definitely agree is the danger of chasing those advertising money there lies danger yeah, absolutely. I think my my thing here is I want podcasters to, to be demanding from advertisers that they they pay for the show you've already got. Yeah. Um, recognize that your audience is valuable. Those those small niche audiences that are highly cultivated are highly valuable. Make them pay for it. And this actually lean, leans into our uh, anarchist podcaster collective that we just <laughs> suggested, uh, which is uh, I I feel like we should probably if if if, if Advertising continues to be a major form of funding podcasts, which I suspect it will be. Um, we should be working collectively to demand that uh, these advertisers pay shows what they're worth. Uh, which means and, we need to talk to each other about what they're paying us. Yes. And I, I think it also means that we need to stop taking uh, the uh, uh, the sucker's bet of, uh, of Audible, where it's if you happen to remember my special code and this person happens to sign up and stay a member for a month, you yeah. will get $15 full stop. Um, that, have, I, have I mentioned my Lord and Savior Agora Podcast Network? <laughs> that um, <laughs> we're we're not as organized as we should be right now, but that is more that or less is. our ethos. Oh, Fantastic. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Anyway, um, we're at time. 
Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to end with that bit of self promotion. No, um, like thank that. you That's so good. much for uh, for this this talk and making time for us, uh, both of you. And um, for uh, I'll let you uh, do some plugs in a sec. But for everyone else who might be interested in keeping the conversation going, um, there is an after party. BYOB. Uh, I will be there in about two hours because I owe my wife childcare. <laughs> uh, but there are people who are there who are going straight there uh, from the command team. And I'm sure uh, the speakers are going straight there and everything. It is always a good time. Uh, I've done this three years running. Every time, every time there's like this two, three hour gap where I'm putting my kid to bed and I come back, I'm like, no one's going to be here. I'm just going to be drinking alone. And it's still packed. So, um, Everyone go over there. It's a great time. And with that, uh, Jamie and Z, please let everyone know where they can find you and do your sign off. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, and you can find us on everything. We are not behind a walled garden. Uh, <laughs> so search for the British History Podcast and you'll find us. Uh, you can also go to our website, thebritishhistorypodcast.com. Uh, you can find our contact information there. It's the British History Podcast at Oh, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach me at the British History Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, and <laughs> thank you so much for having yeah, us. Thank you so much. This was a, a lot of fun. Thanks, Ben. Great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.